There they are. There are the two characters. Um, I want to talk about the one to the, on the right side for a minute. Our image of World War II was largely formed by Winston Churchill, his award-winning six-volume history of the war that he published between 1948 and 1953. If you want to see his impact on how we look at the war, just look at the titles of each volume. The Gathering Storm, Their Finest Hour, The Grand Alliance, The Hinge of Fate, Closing the Ring, and Triumph and Tragedy. And in these volumes, Churchill gave us a very detailed and personal history of what he labeled the special relationship between Britain and the United States during the war as personified by his relationship with U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt. But with the declassification of almost all U.S. and British World War II documents decades later, and it took about 30 years for the documents to become declassified. And at that point, it began to become clear that what Churchill wrote in these volumes was far from a complete or objective history. Instead, what it really was was a lengthy memoir with political motivations masquerading as a history. And he knew it. Quote, History will bear me out, he once said, particularly as I shall write that history. <laughs> and he did. He did. This is not history, he said to one of his assistants. This is my case. And that is what a memoir usually is. Uh, we didn't treat it as such because we had few other documents during those early years with which to compare what he wrote. And there was no one who could write as well as he could. Um, there is, by the way, if you're interested in the process, how he got his the per permission to use these highly classified documents as early as 1947, 1948, there is a superb book by my colleague David Reynolds at Cambridge called In Command of History, which is about the writing of uh, these six volumes. Now, what I'd like to do this evening is examine what we now know about the origins and development of the personal relationship between these two men and the role it played in the creation and functioning of the Anglo-American Wartime Alliance. Um, it's going to be different from Churchill's version. Churchill's version was quite accurate in some ways and quite inaccurate in other ways, usually on purpose for political reasons. He was still an active politician at the time. In fact, before the last volume came out, he became the prime minister again for the second time. Okay. We're dealing here both with Churchill and with Roosevelt with two very powerful and extraordinary political um, individuals. Interestingly, each one came from an aristocratic family. Each was a fast rising star before and during World War I. But each was considered politically finished very soon thereafter. Roosevelt, because of his polio, an ensuing paralysis at age 39 in 1921. He would never walk again. Churchill, because of his party shifts. First, he shifted in 1904 from the Conservative Party to the Liberal Party. Then in 1925, he shifted back to the Conservative Party. He also took positions that were highly unpopular during the 1930s. He opposed the independence of India. He opposed the abdication of the king, and he opposed appeasement. Opposing appeasement was anything but popular in England in the 1930s. He also had a reputation as an alcoholic, which I would say was probably true. He was that great rarity, a functioning alcoholic. C.P. Snow once quipped that he was not an alcoholic because no alcoholic could drink that much. 
Um, my colleague and friend Warren Kimball refers to him, instead of as an alcoholic, as alcohol dependent. More on, little more on that later. But each of these men reemerged Phoenix-like politically. Roosevelt first as governor of the state of New York, then as president in 1933. Churchill reemerges in 1939 as first Lord of the Admiralty with the failure of the appeasement policy and the start of World War II. And then, in the spring of 1940, he becomes Prime Minister and Defense Minister at the same time. Now, had these two ever met before 1941? They once did in London during World War I, a meeting that Roosevelt remembered negatively. He later referred to Churchill as a stinker. Churchill did not remember it at all, which did not make Roosevelt feel very happy. But when Churchill rejoined the cabinet in 1939 as first Lord of the Admiralty, Roosevelt initiated what would become a very lengthy personal correspondence. They would exchange approximately 1,700 letters and telegrams between 1939 and 1945. And what Roosevelt did in that first one was to invite Churchill and with him the Prime Minister, still the Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, to quote, keep me in touch personally with anything you want me to know about. That, that's quite a letter to get from the President of the United States. It was typical FDR style. Very personal relationship to foreign policy and to domestic politics. The correspondence would expand massively when Churchill replaces Chamberlain as Prime Minister on May 10th, 1940, just at the moment that Britain faces catastrophe as the Germans conquer Denmark, Norway, the Low Countries, and then France in June of 1940, May, June of 1940. Britain now stands alone against an Adolf Hitler in control of all of Europe. Now, Roosevelt had joined Churchill in viewing Hitler as a mortal threat during the 1930s. And now he wants to help Britain and France, but is quite limited in how he, he, he could do so. Supposedly, and the word that's always used is the isolationist strand of American thinking. I don't like that word. How did isolationists create the most powerful nation the world has ever seen? You know, as one of my colleagues and friends put it, boy, those isolationists sure do get around. Um, the word that I, I prefer is anti-interventionist. We got fooled in World War I. We are not going to enter another war. The entry into the First World War, which at that point was known as the Great War, is considered by a majority of Americans to have been an error. It did not end all wars, as Woodrow Wilson said it would. It did not make the world safe for democracy. Instead, it just set the seeds for a second world, world war. And this time, the argument went, we are not going to get sucked in. We will outlaw the acts that we see now led to our entry into World War I. I think the mood is best summarized. This is a uh, harsh cartoon, to put it mildly. Can you see it? OK. That is death as a pro war, and death, the, the, the skeleton, as a prostitute. And what does it say? Come on in. I'll treat you right. I used to know your daddy. Yeah. Congress passes a series of neutrality acts from 1935 to 1939 that outlaws the sale of arms or the giving of loans to belligerent powers, travel on belligerent ships, or any trade in US merchant ships. You want to buy anything from us? You bring your ship over, you load it, you put cash down on the barrel. It's called cash and carry. Goodbye. That's all. Now, Roosevelt didn't like these bills, but he signed them because he wanted the support of the anti-interventionists who supported the New Deal. 
uh, the New Deal was primary to him at this point. The New Deal comes first. He did manage, after the war started in 1939, to get the embargo on the sale of arms lifted. And that was put on cash and carry along with every, everything else. But then a dramatic shift begins with the fall of France in June of 1940. Britain now stands alone. Its position, from any sane military point of view, is hopeless. But Churchill refuses to sue for peace. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie Darkest Hour? OK? Not a bad movie at all. I am so glad, finally, that what went on in that British cabinet is now made public. It, the, the rise of Churchill doesn't mean that appeasement has ended. And in fact, appeasement's very rational if you think of the situation that is being faced. I loved the first half. Okay? The second half was pure Hollywood schlock. Uh, going, Churchill going down into the tubes. Come on, give, give me a break. Um, uh, but what you do get from him, there's that wonderful quote of his, uh, not of his, but of another member of the cabinet that I believe they end the movie with. He has mobilized the English language as a weapon of war. Uh, that incredible rhetoric. Uh, all I have to offer you is blood, toil, tears, and sweat. And that if the RAF succeeds and Britain survives, it will be known as their finest hour. But in reality, Britain's position is hopeless. And Churchill's only real hope is American aid and eventual in, in, intervention. And he knows it, and he tells people this. Let me quote to you from one of his most famous uh, speeches. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And if, which I do not for a moment believe, this island or a large part of it was subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until, in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, steps forth to the rescue and liberation of the old. There you have it. Now, a major shift begins to take place in American public opinion and in Roosevelt's behavior. Um, First of all, you get the mobilization of public opinion with the formation of the Committee to Defend America by Aiding the Allies. That title alone speaks uh, volumes. Then on June 10th, Roosevelt in Charlottesville denounces Italy for entering the war on Germany's side, talking about the hand that held the dagger, has uh, uh, plunged it into the back of its uh, neighbor, uh, and he attacks isolationism. He attacks it openly for the first time. He also creates a bipartisan cabinet. He appoints interventionist Republicans into the positions of Secretary of War and Secretary of the Navy, Henry Stimson and Frank Knox. You also get the first billion dollar defense bills in US history. There is a 500 percent increase in defense spending in the spring and summer of 1940 and you get the first peacetime draft in American history. But a major argument then, then ensues with, between Roosevelt and his Army and Navy chiefs, George Marshall and Harold Stark. Who's going to get this new military equipment? Their forces, American forces, or the British? And in many ways, you know, I, I think one of the most difficult things in history, but the most important thing, is get your headset back into that time period. Ignore what you know happened. Okay? Imagine it is the summer of 1940. Okay? Uh, Battle of Britain is raging. It looks like the British are finished. Who is Hitler going to come after next? Us. Uh, and here is a president who wants to sell arms and ammunition 
to the British that the US Army needs. Uh, one of George Marshall's uh, staff members puts it very nicely. Uh, if we agreed to sell this, these guns and ammunition to the British, and then we're found to be lacking them ourselves, you and I might be found hanging from the nearest lamppost. He left unclear whether the hanging would be done by the Germans or by the American people. Um, Roosevelt insists that Britain is going to survive all signs to the contrary notwithstanding and that the material should be sold to them. Um, there is a problem. Congress has passed a law saying you cannot give away war material unless the uh, Army chief and Navy chief have certified that it is not needed for the defense of the United States. And what the British need most of all are warships against German submarines on the high seas. Um, Roosevelt wants to give them, not give really, it's the wrong word, um, 50 overage US destroyers from World War I. In return, he says, it's a swap. In return, they're going to give us 99-year leases on base sites, naval and air base sites, in the Western Hemisphere on British and French-controlled islands. Uh, and he gets the chief of naval operations to say, this is a net strategic gain for us. Uh, rumor mill had it, he had to twist Admiral Stark's arm pretty hard to get him to agree to, to that. Um, the, he also gets, though, and the Americans insist that Churchill promise never to surrender or never to allow the British fleet to fall into German hands. Churchill is insulted. Empires do not bargain, he says, over a secure telephone link that they make at that point. The Attorney General shoots, uh, shoots back, republics do. <laughs> you want them? You bargain for, for them. 70% of the public supported this deal, but only 5% supported US entry into the war at this point. Interesting. And beyond this, Roosevelt will not go. He is running for an unprecedented third term. A committee has formed called the America First Committee, yes, um, and its basic point is to keep America out of this war. Well, Roosevelt wins re-election. He has to, at the end, make that pledge. I have said it once, I'll say it again. Your boys are not going to be sent off to fight in foreign wars, at which point his opponent, Wendell Wilkie, supposedly said, that son of a bitch. He's just won the election with that lie, in, in effect. Uh, he, didn't, he did use that, that SOB comment, but the last part was my translation of the words that he used. Well, with Roosevelt's reelection in November of 1940, Churchill decides it's time to level with Roosevelt, at least to an extent, as to what's going on, and get the United States into the war. He sends the most carefully prepared of all his messages to Roosevelt. He said, quote, the most important I ever wrote. What does he say? Britain is running out of money to purchase war materials and ships to get that material across the submarine infested Atlantic. What does he want? He wants loans, which are prohibited by the Neutrality Acts. He wants merchant ships, US merchant ships, and US naval escorts as well as war materiel. Roosevelt won't go along with this. It would require him to ask Congress to repeal the, new, the Neutrality Acts, and he fears he won't get that. Uh, it would require a declaration of war that he definitely could not get. He decides instead to focus on the money issue by removing what he says in the December 17th press conference, quote, the silly, foolish old dollar sign, and suggests that Congress agree to lend or lease war material to the British free of charge. 
And that famous analogy he says, suppose your neighbor's house is on fire. And he comes to you and says, neighbor, can I borrow your garden hose? Are you going to ask him for cash on the barrel? Or are you going to give him the garden hose, protect your home if he can put out his fire with it? Uh, and then later you'll get the hose back. Um, he also says at the end of 1940, in a famous fireside chat where he would talk to the American people by radio, that the United States should become the arsenal of democracy. We should give Britain this war material free of charge because Britain is our first line of defense, and this is a way to avoid our entry into the war. Um, he also, a week later, in his annual message to Congress, enunciates the four freedoms. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. And he poses it not as domestic aims, but as international aims to, uh, to, to achieve. And what begins here is what the historian Susan Dunn has called the third 100 days. Uh, historians pointed out during the New Deal, it was the first 100 days, the second 100 days. You now get a third where Roosevelt really springs into action. No, I don't want anything at this, this moment. I did that on purpose, if you don't mind. Okay? The opponents say Lend-Lease will lead to war, not keep the United States out. Um, uh, Senator Burton Wheeler refers to Lend-Lease as the New Deal's triple A in foreign policy. The triple A was the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which plowed under acreage to raise farm prices at the worst time in the Depression. Wheeler says this is the New Deal's triple A in foreign policy. It'll plow under every fourth American boy. Uh, Roosevelt is livid when he hears that. Uh, a bit more amusing, but still making the point, is the comment of isolationist Senator Robert Taft. War material, he says, is like chewing gum. After it's been used, do you really want it back? Um, America first under General Robert Wood, with Charles Lindbergh as its spokesperson, argues against this. Lend-Lease passes in March by votes of 60 to 31 in the Senate and 31 to 7, to 7 excuse me, and 317 to 71 in the House with a $7 billion appropriation to start with. That's in 1941 dollars. It'll be 50 billion by the end of the war, with 60% of it going to Great Britain and the others to other US allies once the United States enters the war. Now, by the way, at the same time that this is going on, this debate's going on, Admiral Stark, the naval chief, has sent Roosevelt a memo proposing secret staff conversations with the British in the event the United States enters the war. We've got to have a war plan. And he says the war plan should be to defeat Germany first, to assume the strategic defensive against the Japanese and defeat Germany first if the United States enters the war. Uh, that's all that is, is the basic war plan of World War II for the Allies. Uh, and he comes, Stark comes up with it at this point. Roosevelt agrees, the British agree, and the result you will have in the spring, secret Anglo-American agreements and a revised American war plan in the event of US entry into the war, we will fight with the British, and we shall defeat the Germans first. Roosevelt also extends the hemispheric defense line eastward, first to Greenland in April of 1941, and then to Iceland in July, which is an interesting definition of the Western Hemisphere, if you stop and think about it, and a beefed up Atlantic fleet. Now again, that fleet is not to engage German submarines. It is simply to, quote, patrol. Uh, furthermore, in June, both Churchill and Roosevelt welcome Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin as an ally when Hitler attacks the Soviet Union. Churchill is probably the most famous anti-communist in the world. Uh, had been since World, world War I and yet he welcomes Stalin. And his private secretary, Sir John Colville, says, Prime Minister, you know, what are you doing publicly welcoming Stalin? 
And Churchill's answer is a gem. If Hitler invaded hell, I would at least make a favorable reference to the devil in the House of Commons. I have but one aim, and it has simplified my life. Lend-lease is extended to the Soviet Union by the United States as well. And then Roosevelt agrees to meet Churchill in August of 1941 off the coast of Newfoundland. And that's where this photo comes from, their first meeting. Uh, the result of this meeting will be the issuance of the Atlantic Charter, which is really a statement of combined war aims. People have called it the 14 points of World War II. We seek a world free of, of, of um, want and fear, a world based on national self-determination, de and on and on. And you get the stirring scenes which are played in movie theaters around the United States of the two of them on board their warships in this bay off the coast of Newfoundland with a religious service conducted Sunday morning. Uh, that's where that photo, I believe, comes from. Now, Churchill knew that this was a political meeting, um, but that the personal component of it was critical. As he put it to April Harriman, who had been sent to England by Roosevelt, but that's a whole other story I won't get into, he turned to Harriman after the first meeting and said, but does he like me? Uh, not that Churchill needed that, but that he knew that this had to be an alliance that had a personal component to it that, uh, that actually worked. Um, it's the first of 10 meetings the two of them will have. So, some say 11, depending on how you want to count. They will spend a total of 113 days together during the war in a period of, uh, oh, let's see, 42, 43, 44, um, about three and a half years, okay? Um, Roosevelt did like him very much, albeit with limits set by his own personality as well as his political position. The playwright and biographer, Robert Sherwood, referred to Roosevelt's heavily forested interior. Um, you never knew what he was really thinking. Um, uh, when I did research at Hyde Park, the Roosevelt home, I, I would take a break at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, walk around, and I could swear I heard him laughing, saying, neither you nor anyone else is ever going to figure me out. Uh, he is one of the most brilliant and devious political minds, I think, that this country has ever had, behind this front of jovial, simple-mindedness. You don't get elected president four times by being a simpleton. Maybe once. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist that. Um, uh, Churchill was disappointed. He didn't get Roosevelt to commit to going to war. He wanted to obtain a formal pledge for this. He didn't get it. Roosevelt was still fearful of his Congress. He had only one extension of the draft by one vote in Congress while this was going on. And there are two quotes which I think show you the two sides of Roosevelt here. Roosevelt himself, famous crack, it is a terrible thing to look over your shoulder when you are trying to lead and find no one there. He had been Woodrow Wilson's assistant secretary of the Navy and had seen what had happened to Wilson with the League of Nations fight. It's not going to happen to him. But others say um, uh, he really did lead, and he manipulated public opinion, but in a very, very subtle manner. The King of England, who visited um, Roosevelt, um, wrote in June of 1941 that he had been struck, quote, struck by the way you have led public opinion by allowing it to get ahead of you. Um, ponder that one for a while. Uh, and I don't have the time to go into the back and forth here. 
just to present the two sides. Um, I don't think Roosevelt had any close friends. I, I, think, uh, I think he used people. Um, and he was friends with Churchill as long as Churchill was useful to him. Uh, that may have been the personality that you needed to lead in the situation that you, that you had. Now, Churchill did report to the cabinet that Roosevelt had said he would wage war without declaring it, which is what Roosevelt did when he announced in early September that a U.S. warship, the USS Greer, had been wantonly attacked by a German submarine and that he was therefore giving orders to the U.S. Navy to shoot German submarines on sight. Um, what he didn't mention was that the Greer had been trailing the U-boat and radioing its position back to a British fleet, which had then sent aircraft to attack the ship and drop depth charges on it. Um, I have always said, you know, there was a freshman congressman who worshipped Roosevelt while this was going on named Lyndon Johnson. Draw your own conclusions about that. Um, by October, Roosevelt is asking for an end to the crippling provisions of the Neutrality Act so that he could arm U.S. merchant ships and have them carry lend-lease supplies to Britain escorted by destroyers of the U.S. Navy. Congress agreed after the U.S. warship, the Reuben James, was sunk by a submarine with the loss of 100, approximately 100 U.S. sailors. And really what you get from that point on, October, November, early December of 1941, is an undeclared naval war with Nazi Germany and an unofficial alliance with Great Britain. But war, of course, came on the other side of the world. Uh, December of 1941, with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor um, and on British as well as U.S. possessions in the Western Pacific and Asia, um, followed by the U.S. and British declarations of war on Japan, and then, for reasons that still stymie his historians, Hitler declared war on the United States on December 11, 1941. Um, after the Pearl Harbor attack, Churchill used, the, there was a phone that you could use. It was, it was not the safest thing in the world in terms of espionage. But he called and said to Roosevelt, we are all in the same boat now. And they were. OK, now Churchill, again, with that incredible um, prose, in his memoirs said that he heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor on the same day that he heard news of the Soviet counteroffensive in front of Moscow, which threw back the last German effort to take Moscow in 1941. And here's what Churchill wrote in his memoirs. So we had won after all. United, we could subdue everybody else in the world. Saturated and satiated with emotion and sensation, I went to bed and slept the sleep of the saved and thankful. Um, there was one problem with that. Who says the United States is going to concentrate on Germany despite what it pledged to do after the Pearl Harbor attack? Churchill is terrified that the Americans are going to go after the Japanese. And he decides to come to Washington right away to make sure that does not happen. This will result in a major wartime conference, the Arcadia Conference, during which the key structures of the Grand Alliance is set up. Germany first is reestablished. Principle of unity of command in all theaters of war, all British and American ground, naval, and air forces shall be under a single commander of one of the two countries. That's extraordinary if you stop and you think about it. You create the combined chiefs of staff a body composed of the British and American chiefs of staff who will meet in person every time Churchill and Roosevelt meet. Uh, and other times, the British will be represented by a high-ranking delegation in Washington. And they will plan out, with the prime minister and the president, global strategy. Here are the combined chiefs of staff, British and American. Now, the Americans had to come up with an organization to match the British or organization of chiefs of staff 
so that they could meet as equals. So they form a body known as the Joint Chiefs of Staff. This is where the Joint Chiefs of Staff originate. They exist solely by executive decree. They don't have a charter until 1947. Uh, when they ask for one, Roosevelt, and this again speaks volumes about the man, you don't need that. Um, he holds the power in his hands. You also create an enormous number of combined boards to run the war, including boards that will share intelligence information at the highest level, that includes Ultra Enigma, and share nuclear secrets about the building of the atomic bomb. Uh, you also have the formal declaration of the alliance on January 1st, the declaration by the United Nations. Yes, the name of the international organization is taken from the name of the alliance, and that was done very consciously. In order to be an original member of the UN, you had to be at war with one of the Axis powers. Uh, that was the sine qua non. Churchill stays at the White House during this conference. And this is when their friendship is really established. Famous story, Roosevelt didn't believe in locked doors in the White House, except for the map room, uh, which was where really war strategy was, uh, all the key top secret papers were there. But otherwise, all doors were open. Um, and uh, one day, he wheeled himself into Churchill's room as Churchill was getting out of the bathtub. Uh, and there stood the prime minister in his birthday suit. And Roosevelt began to, with his wheelchair, back out. And Churchill said, please, Mr. President, stay. His Majesty's first minister has absolutely nothing to hide from the President of the United States. <laughs> um, he had a lot to hide, actually. It was a nice quip. I think much more telling of um, the relationship at this point in February, Roosevelt will write to him, it is fun to be in the same decade with you. Um, th that fun would drive their military advisors crazy at times as they came up with harebrained schemes in the middle of the uh, night. But um, the, the bathtub crack and the fun to be in the same decade with you crack um, mask some essential differences between the two. What are they over? Proper combined strategy against Germany. The British approach, if I can find my map here. British approach, known as the peripheral approach, is to, in Churchill's words, close a ring around Germany, get control of French North Africa, control of the Mediterranean, strategic bombing, commando raids, uh, soften Germany up invade the continent only as last move. The Americans, the exact op opposite. What uh, Stimson labels this pinprick, pinprick warfare. You want to defeat the Germans, you come to terms with the German army on the continent of Europe. It's the only way you are going to win. Churchill presents the peripheral strategy at the conference says, let's control Vichy French North Africa in 1942. Uh, and he's much blunter in this paper with Roosevelt than he previously had been. And when his chiefs of staff point this out to him and say, why, with, according to one of them, with a, um, why don't you use the language you used before with a wicked leer? Uh, Churchill says, oh, that was the language we used when we were wooing her. Now that she is in the harem, we speak to her quite differently. There is also disagreement on post-war territorial accords. Stalin demands them. Churchill is willing to agree to them. Roosevelt is not. Territorial accords during the war will weaken public support for the war. What is to be the future of European colonial empires? Roosevelt wants to end them, while Churchill is the strongest defender of European colonial empires. And early on in the war, the two of them have a blowout over India. And Roosevelt, after that blowout, and it was Churchill who was, who was yelling, 
Uh, Roosevelt says, I will not raise it with him again directly. But that doesn't change his views, that colonialism is wrong. It is a cause of war. And one basic American aim is to end the European colonial em empires. Post-war trade policy. US favors an open door, free trade policy. The British want an imperial preference system. And the personalities of these two men are quite different, as are their working hours and their children and their drinking habits. Now, Roosevelt is not a teetotaler. In fact, he had every day what he called the children's hour, where he would personally mix martinis. He mixed them with um, both dry and sweet vermouth in large quantities. It was a vile concoction, but if it's offered to you by the President of the United States, you are going to drink it, though uh, Kimball claims that uh, Churchill was very adept at finding flower pots uh, in which to dump them. Um, uh, Roosevelt was not, Churchill liked to stay up the whole night drinking, smoking cigars. Um, <laughs> Roosevelt, being quite weak and ill, did not, and Eleanor Roosevelt definitely did not like it. And these late night meetings would infuriate their military advisors. Now, 1942 is going to be dominated by this strategic dispute. Do we invade French North Africa or do we cross the channel in 1942? The American military chiefs want to try to cross the channel. The major crossing, they say, will be in 43. But we want to throw whatever we can across and establish a foothold in 1942. At first, the British agree, primarily because they fear that if they don't agree, the Americans will turn to the Pacific. Um, and the Americans say, this is the only way to keep the Soviets in the war. And if the Soviets drop out of the war, you are in real trouble. Let me destroy a couple of myths, by the way about the American, British, and Soviet war efforts. Uh, uh, you watch Hollywood, you'd think that the Americans won the war with a little help from the British, OK? Few stats, OK? The American um, war dead in World War II, which is the second highest total of any American war, a hideous total, 405,000. Um, the British total is um, in the 400,000 area. Uh, together, their combined total is between 850 and 900,000 dead. The Soviets lose more men dead in the single battle of Stalingrad and more starved to death in the siege of Leningrad. The Soviet death toll is approximately 27 million. Um, there is no victory. Uh, this, it's the Red Army that destroys the Wehrmacht. Churchill admits this. And without keeping the Soviets in, there is no victory in World War II. Um, but Roosevelt had told Stalin that they were going to cross the channel in 42. And Churchill flew to Moscow after the decision to invade North Africa to explain to Stalin why they were not crossing the channel, but instead going to French North Africa, which is when he drew his famous crocodile with the analogy of hitting the soft underbelly as well as the snout. But he promised that in 1943 there would be a major crossing of the channel. Well, there couldn't be, because the fight for French North Africa didn't end until May of 1943. Um, Hitler decided to hold Tunisia. Rommel's forces, after El Alamein, escape into Tunisia. Further reinforcements are sent in and you don't defeat the German and Italian forces until May of 1943. Um, before you do that, Churchill and Roosevelt meet at the captured Moroccan port of Casablanca and have to decide, what do we do next? This is, decision is, we'll invade Sicily, we'll launch a combined bomber offensive against Germany, we'll give top 
priority to the U-boat war, but we will postpone any channel crossing. What is best known about this conference is not anything that I've just mentioned, but Roosevelt's enunciation of a policy of unconditional surrender for the Axis powers at a press conference at the end of the war. There's a great deal of mythology about this um, announcement, partially the fault of Churchill, who claimed in his memoirs he never knew the president was going to say this. He'd never talked about it with him. It, it came out of the blue, but you don't contradict the president of the United States at a press conference. Nonsense. It was not a surprise to him. The only surprise was the exact timing. It had been discussed in the British cabinet. It had been, Roosevelt had discussed it with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In fact, it had always been allied policy. It was the lowest common denominator holding the alliance together. Why? The World War I experience. You allowed Germany a conditional surrender. No allied soldiers invaded Germany at the time you agreed to an armistice for the Germans. The result was Hitler's stab in the back myth. We didn't lose the war. We were betrayed by the socialists and the Jews. Uh, we're not going to allow that to happen again, say the Allies. Plus, please tell me what sort of a negotiated peace you could possibly have with Adolf Hitler, who had broken every agreement he had ever signed. Roosevelt also enunciated it now um, because in North Africa, you had worked with a Vichy French collaborator. Admiral Darlan to get the French to lay down their arms, and there had been an uproar in American and British public opinion. And you want to reassure Stalin that there, in light of no channel crossing, we're not changing. We're still staying in this with you to the bitter end. And so it is e enunciated. And with this conference, you see really the high point of the Roosevelt Churchill relationship. Evening, private evening sessions together. Churchill has a dr them drive together to Marrakesh and then has Roosevelt carried up 60 steps into a tower to oversee sunset over the Atlas Mountains, which he referred to as, quote, the most lovely sight in the whole world. Then he will paint Roosevelt. He will go to the airport at dawn to see Roosevelt off and will comment to an aide, quote, he is the truest friend. He has the farthest vision. He is the greatest man I have ever known. That is really the high point, OK? Then things begin to go downhill between the two of them. There are more meetings after Casablanca, but they're marked by disagreements on strategy and the post-war world and uh, a change in Roosevelt's attitude. They remain friends, but Roosevelt is more and more willing to disagree with Churchill and to lie to him. He tries to arrange a private meeting with Stalin off the coast of Alaska in 1943. And when Churchill finds out, Roosevelt goes, who, me? No, you know, not me. I didn't do that. But he did. The documentation is crystal clear that he did that. Roosevelt also backs his chiefs in saying, we must cross the channel in 44. Enough of this peripheral packing. We must do it in 44. Churchill at first agrees, but then Mussolini is overthrown, and Italy is knocked out of the war in 43 and invaded. And that opens up all sorts of options, as Churchill sees it, even though Hitler sends troops into Italy to prevent the Allies from moving up. And by the fall of 1943, Churchill is pressing for another delay in crossing the Channel um, in order to take islands in the Aegean as a way to bring Turkey into the war. Uh, Roosevelt refuses to agree, at least not in advance. You are trying to set up a tripartite meeting with Stalin. And basically, Roosevelt says, let's decide there. And you get this meeting at the Iranian capital of Tehran. And there are the three of them, in the famous shot shown uh, around the world. Um, 
at Tehran, Roosevelt and Stalin will combine reject Churchill's pleas and insist on the cross-channel invasion Operation Overlord as scheduled for May of 1944. Roosevelt also needles Churchill mercilessly at this meeting in an effort to establish a personal relationship with Stalin and disabuse Stalin of the notion that he and Churchill are ganging up on him. Uh, Stalin needled Churchill as well. Uh, this became the game at the dinners uh, that night. And, and sometimes the humor, the attempts to do this, got really sickening. Um, Stalin, when they talked about the future of Germany, Stalin said, uh, the Germans, the only th way you can prevent World War III is to destroy the German general staff. They have started two world wars. We must shoot 50,000 German officers. Now, Stalin was very capable of doing that, but Charles Bolin, who was translating, said the language, the Russians, that Stalin was using, he was trying to get jab at Churchill and see what sort of a reaction, oh, did he get a reaction. Churchill exploded in anger and stalked out of the room. Stalin and Molotov had to come after him to bring him back in, say we were only kidding. Uh, Roosevelt um, had, before Churchill stalked out, said, okay, gentlemen, we've got a compromise. Let's shoot 49,000 instead of 50,000. That didn't sit well um, with Churchill or with anyone. Um, but the Soviet Union and the United States basically gang up on Churchill and the British at this conference because they are the growing powers. Britain has reached its mobilization peak in the war, whereas the United States and Soviet Union, their economic power, their military power are still growing. They have greater populations, greater size, greater industry. Churchill later commented that at Tehran was the first time he realized what a small country Britain was. There I sat, he wrote, on one side of me, the great Russian bear, paws outstretched, and on the other side, the great American buffalo, and in between was me, the poor little English donkey, who was the only one who knew the right way home. <laughs> but nobody would listen to him. More disagreements throughout 1944. Um, are you going to invade southern France from Italy, as had been agreed to? Or are you going to instead what Churchill wants to do, uh, invade the Adriatic coast and go all the way up through the supposed gap in the mountains to v Vienna? Um, this is Churchill's soft underbelly. Marshall's later comment was, the soft underbelly had chrome steel baseboards. Uh, it would not have worked. The Americans insist on southern France. Um, the Bretton Woods Conference, which sets up the post-war e economic system, illustrates American economic post-war dominance, as does the American insistence that Britain abandon imperial preference in order to get a continuation of lend-lease aid after German surrender, but before the Japanese surrender. And there is this scene at the conference in Quebec in 1944 where Roosevelt has agreed to this, but he won't sign the, the, the thing. And, and finally, Churchill says, what do I have to do? Get on my hind legs like your dog Fala and beg? Uh, um, Roosevelt, by the way, by that time, is showing signs of the illness that will kill him. Back to that in just a moment. When he can't get what he wants from the Americans, Churchill turns to Stalin, and he signs a spheres of influence deal with Stalin in October of 1944, uh, which he talks about at length in his memoirs, where he says, uh, um, how about uh, in the post-war era, uh, you get 90% predominance in Romania, and we have 90% to the say in Greece, and we go 50-50 in Yugoslavia. And while that's being translated, Churchill writes it out on a piece of paper, and they deal with Hungary and Bulgaria in the same way. These are Churchill's words now. 
I pushed this across to Stalin, who by then had heard the translation. There was a slight pause, then he took his blue pencil and made a large tick upon it and passed it back to us. It was all settled in no more time than it takes to set down. Uh, after this, there was a long silence. The pencil paper lay in the center of the table. At length, I said, might it not be thought rather cynical if it seemed we had disposed of these issues so faithful to millions of people in such an offhand manner? Let's burn the paper. To which Stalin responds, no, you keep it. Make of that what you will. But at that point, um, Roosevelt realizes they're making post-war deals, which I said I didn't want to occur while the war was on. We can't postpone these anymore. And the result, you get the most notorious conference at the war, the one at Yalta. I'm going to show you a famous photo, if I can find it, from that conference. You made, here's the Tehran photo, OK? Famous one. Uh, I am so sorry. It got, there it is. Got it. Here's Yalta. Roosevelt's dying. Uh, there's no question about it at this stage, but who do you, how do you tell the President of the United States he's dying? Um, did Roosevelt ever accept it? We will never know. Um, the mythology during the Cold War years is that this is where Roosevelt, sick and dying, gave away half of the world to Stalin. The truth of the matter is, first of all, this was not a peace conference. This was a war conference. Germany's armies are still in the field, as are the Japanese. The primary purpose is to keep the alliance going and win the war on the basis of unconditional surrender. But they also have to deal with post-war issues. I defy anyone in this room to show me a square inch of territory that Roosevelt gave to Stalin that was at that moment occupied by the US Army. There was none. This is hindsight mythology in terms of what happened. What you had here was compromise. All three compromised. If you want to use a dirty word, OK, did Roosevelt appease Stalin? Yes, so did Churchill. So did Stalin appease Churchill and Roosevelt. That is what allies do. Appeasement's not a dirty word because it was so misused during the 1930s. It is one of the oldest principles in affairs between nations, and in fact, in affairs between people. When was the last time each of you appeased a member of your family? Or was appeased by a member of your family? This is my one-person crusade to point out that what was done in the 30s was atrocious. It was one of the most disastrous policies possible. It was good reason. They tried it, but it was a but that doesn't mean the principle is wrong. If you have allies, you give in on certain things to get certain things back. Um, if it can be attacked, it can be attacked on the grounds that many argue Stalin broke the accords that he, that, that he signed. That's a different matter. But remember, the key aim of Hitler is to split the alliance. And they can't allow that to happen. They have to see if they can continue to get along for the uh, rest of the war and into the post-war era, or Germany will rise up yet again and do it once more. Did Roosevelt change his mind? In one of his last messages to Stalin, when Stalin accused him of trying to negotiate a separate peace, he wrote, I cannot avoid a feeling of bitter resentment toward your informers, whoever they are, for such vile misrepresentations of my actions and those of my trusted uh, aides. That, that is not being nice language. Um, but then in his last letter to Churchill, he writes, I would minimize the general Soviet problem as much as possible because these problems in one form or another seem to arise every day and most of them straighten out as in the case of this last uh, meeting issue. We must be firm, however, and our course thus far is correct. And with that, posing for a portrait, Roosevelt says, I have a, ter a terrific headache and collapses uh, with a cerebral hemorrhage, and he dies. So what, do we, what can we conclude about this? I'm just looking at the time and saying, I think it's time that 
I brought this to a conclusion, though I could go on. Um, the friendship between the two of them was vital to victory in World War II and to the formation of the special relationship between the two that will continue throughout the entire Cold War era. It was not the only Anglo-American friendship at a very high level. There were many, many others. Perhaps most notably, um, Army Chief of Staff George Marshall and former uh, head of the Imperial Gen General Staff, Field Marshal Sir John Dill, who was the head of the British military mission to the US. And they became fast friends, very close friends. Also, the relationship between Churchill and Roosevelt was based on politics as well as friendship. And it was never really a relationship of equals. In 1940-41, Churchill is the supplicant. Um, 42 to early 43, that's the closest to when they are equals and on the same page. Uh, then from mid-43 to 45, as British power de declines while US and Soviet power goes up, this affects Roosevelt's behavior towards Churchill. Um, so there is the politics part. In terms of the personality component of the friendship, again, I would argue it was never equal. Churchill loved Roosevelt from everything I have read. I am not certain Roosevelt was capable of truly loving anybody. Um, uh, and I don't say that to condemn him, but simply to recognize a personality type. He used people. Uh, you felt good about it. Uh, you know, as one person said, you walked out of his office smiling even though you knew you had just been had. Uh, the one that I love and that I'm going to close with is um, one of his biographers had this recurring maddening dream of playing cards with Roosevelt. And uh, while Roosevelt is talking nonstop, he's also taking cards off the top of the deck and putting them up his sleeve. And biographer Jeffrey Ward concluded, I think it's safe to say all of Franklin Roosevelt's cards were never on the table. And yet, we have got that wonderful statement, it is fun to be in the same decade with you. Thank you for your patience, and I will...